Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome VMware's Chief Executive Officer, Pat Gelsinger. Good morning, good morning. What a great video summarizing some of the key customers and what they're doing with the technologies that we're describing today. This is my sixth VMworld, my fourth as CEO. And I'll tell you, everyone gets better. The energy, the innovation, just great. My job now is to sort of pull these threads together of conversation that we've been having this morning and also giving a point of view and taking what is the path forward that we're pursuing. But before we look forward, let's look back a little bit and see some of the things that we've accomplished. Now, you know, this is the internet and the connectivity of the internet in 1995. How many of you remember your first Mozilla experience in 95? Yeah, you are not the general population. Right? You are the extreme, you know, it's less than half of 1% was connected at that point in time. Yeah, you're, you're our folk, right? You know, we were connected then. I remember my first email, right, that I did. I thought it was so cool, right? And, you know, think about how far we have come from those first days of connectivity. And it's just incredible. So here we stand in 2015. Mobile cloud has now connected 3 billion people across the planet. And our estimates would say Q3 of 19, we will cross half the population of the planet is connected. And think about that. If you think about the connectivity across humanity, this is as connected as we've been since the Roman roads in the time of Christ that we will cross half the world being connected. And, you know, I've just had the Cinderella career of participating with the x86, the foundations of PC technologies, Wi-Fi, USB, and I have this vision, I've always said for my career, that I want to participate in the creation of a piece of technology that touches every human on Earth in every modality of their life. And maybe in the next five years, we'll get halfway there. And to me, this is such a powerful time for us as a technology community to literally be changing the Earth. Now, when we think about connectivity, though, it's not uniformly distributed. North America, nine out of 10 connected. Asia, one out of three. Of China, 600 million people being the largest. Iceland, right, uh, highest rate of connectivity at 98%. I guess if you're in Iceland, what else do you do if you're not connected, so, right? <laughs> Got a long way to go in Africa, just one out of four connected. And of course, for our friends down under, 88%. Any Aussies and Kiwis out there? Yeah. That wasn't very, I, th I heard you guys are pretty rambunctious. That wasn't very impressive, I'll tell you. Aussies and Kiwis out there. Much better, much better. So, and as we think about that rate of connectivity across the planet, the benefits that it brings in terms of education, job creation, health improvements, and as we see what's happening across the world, very much like when mobile telephony emerged, it leapfrogged wired telephony. Right, and what we saw in countries like China was they never built a wired infrastructure, they went straight to a wireless infrastructure. And similarly, as we move to the mobile web, we're seeing emerging countries leap over an entire generation of technology. And as we see that in the countries on the left, this is becoming their modality of connecting to the internet is through a wireless and a mobile experience. You know, in terms of connected uh, devices per person, in 1995.1, so one out of 10, and today here we are in 2015, right, where we're averaging three, uh, to, uh, three devices per person being connected, and the next five years, this will double again. Isn't this really cool? I could be working on my Mac, I can get a message interrupting me on my iPad, right, that gets interrupted by a phone call on my iPhone, and I get a new service on my iWatch uh, interrupting me as well. We have made huge progress, haven't we? But my favorite one, as we look at some of these trends, is actually this one, where if we just look at iOS app revenue, it has now passed the entirety of the US film industry revenues. And I've never been a fan of the cultural impact of Hollywood, and now I'm delighted because we're seeing that you know, the impacts of the tech community is driving this. And if we add on top of this the impact of Android and other platform, it clearly blows away, literally off the chart, right, the uh, economic impact that's occurring and the social right, and cultural transformation. 
And if we look at this in the context of maybe, right, uh, the Academy Awards this last year, right, uh, Birdman, maybe the most influential film of the last year, dominated by angry birds. Yeah, geeks rule. But it's also IT in the stratosphere. And if we zoom out to a satellite view of the Earth, and this is actually, I didn't, didn't realize this before we started preparing the speech for today. There's a UN organization that tracks the register of objects launched into space, right? And this is actually their picture of all the objects that are in space. And who knew? We now have 7,200 objects orbiting Earth and beyond today. The vast majority of those are to bring connectivity, to connect us up even further. But it's not just IT in the stratosphere and in the atmosphere, it's also IT in your bloodstream, right? And this is uh, some research that occurred at the Children's Hospital of Boston and University of Houston, where actually we have many magnetic Miller robo robots that they're injecting into bloodstreams that can be self-formed and create little guns to inject treatment at just the right spot in the body. Isn't that just amazing, right? So we've gone from the stratosphere all the way to our bloodstream. And if we project this forward even further, 10 years from now, estimated that we'll have 5 billion people connected. And our estimates to say about 2029, 2030, we'll hit 80% connectivity across the planet. You know, literally, I think at that point you'd say at 80%, we're globally connected, right? We've now connected the planet. You know, in our careers, in our lifetime, we will have connected the planet. This, of course, is having huge economic impacts. The mobile cloud has transformed business. Today, you know, about $8 trillion is flowing through internet commerce, right? Um, and that is now representing the growth of that is 21% of global GDP growth. So this is every form of GDP growth is now being dominated by that of the internet economy. Now, of some of these trends, and as we look at these trends, powerful trends emerging, you know, from these, I've you know, synthesized five imperatives for digital business that we want to look at in a bit more detail in the time that we have today. You know, and these are five things that we think all of us need to think about, if not must do's for business and IT leaders today. So the first of these is what we'll call asymmetry in business. Now how do you define asymmetry? You know, unequal or unbalanced. The idea of power between two opponents where one clearly is dominating or able to overcome the other. And maybe before we look at asymmetry, let's look at symmetry. Throughout the 1700s, right, Britain and France, we would call those symmetric forces, sophisticated weapons, huge uh, armies, you know, large fleets, similar boats, sort of similar technology, and they sort of fought with each other all over the planet. Right, developed economies that supported those uh, battles. And you know, some would win this battle, some would win this, that battle, because they had sort of, you know, whoever had the better strategy and the better tactics in the day would win the war. And it was a symmetric game. In that same time period, though, we saw an asymmetric battle. This tiny upstart nation of America, right? And basically, they resorted to unconventional tactics hit and run, small but fast ships. To win, they had to change the rules of the game. And that's exactly what we see in business today. People are changing rules of the game. And you know, this is right, incumbents, and this includes VMware. We're one of those incumbents as well. And there are these new startups with nothing to lose that are embracing new models who are attacking and threatening the incumbents. Now, this idea of startups isn't particularly new. It's existed for decades, if not hundreds of years. But what has changed is that mobile cloud technology has enabled a vast set of shared resources to create a asymmetric battle. And if we think about the internet, unlimited reach. If we think about these mobile phones that we carry, we now have unlimited access. And if we think about cloud, we have unlimited scale. And we throw in some crazy venture capitalists and unlimited capital as well. So literally, we're able to have essentially unlimited resources to reach a three billion market with smartphone in time. This is the best time in history to be a challenger versus the status quo. 
And as a result of this, we're seeing vertical industries changed all over the planet. Every one of these is being attacked by a new model, a new asymmetric approach, whether it's mobile health or uh, online healthcare being changed. In my spare time, I sit on the board of a, a university and we're looking at what the impact of massive online education is and looking at smart grids or maybe custom, man, custom manufacturing and 3D printing. Some believe that this will allow the resurgence right, of you know, uh, mature markets and mature economies to re, uh, bring back manufacturing onto their shores because it's now much about robotics and automation and customization and no longer just low cost wage and access, changing industries. And maybe one customer example of that that we've engaged with, a great VMware partner, has been Progressive. And the insurance industry has clearly been one of the oldest and substantial industries, but it is being forced to change very rapidly. And Progressive today views themselves as both an insurance provider, but also a tech company. And they are making a massive shift to an online market, an online selling. And they have to distribute a workforce and enable a distributed workforce beyond just where their buildings and locations are to be able to access workers across the globe. And they are putting mobility at the center of their business model and operations. And what is the most important part of the insurance industry? It's the car, right, and how they insure the car industry. And similarly, the auto sector is undergoing radical changes as well. Now, the first statistic on this page, I think, is the most significant. What's the utilization of your car? Industry estimates are 4%. I travel a lot. Mine is maybe 1%. Right? And the view of, as the shift as we go to fleets of shared, autonomous, subscription, self-driving vehicles, is maybe that goes from 4% to 75%. Can you imagine that? Right. And does that have an impact on the automobile industry over the next 10 to 20 years? If we go from 4 to 75% utilization? I mean, it's dramatic, right? The shift in cost from CapEx to OpEx, the decrease in number of cars, drop in accidents that results. You know, it's estimated that 500 billion hours are spent in the United States alone commuting. Imagine if that became productive time estimated half a trillion dollars of economic benefit. And think about that, how who becomes the leader and the driver of the automotive industry in such a scenario? You know, is it upstarts? Is it traditional companies? Is it people that aren't even listed on this page yet? What does the rental car industry look like 10 years out, the manufacturing industry? How much will those industries change as a result? But it's not just the direct impact on the auto industry, but think of all the downstream implications as well. You know, the insurance industry that we already touched on. You know, what about, you know, real estate? Well, if commuting was, became pretty easy, maybe I wouldn't mind moving out of the city and into the exurbs, as they're called. Maybe it changes every aspect of the distribution and support network around truck routes that we would progress. You know, simply put, it changes everything about one of the oldest aspects of our economy today. And as we think about that, we'll simply summarize imperative number one into elephants must learn to dance, or maybe stated in more business terms where we have to innovate like a startup and deliver like an enterprise, imperative number one. Now, when we thought about that, you know, as we described the three things of reach of the internet economy, we said, right, the scale of the cloud, the reach of mobility, right, and the effects of the internet. And those three, let's look at, a little bit deeper at the cloud, because we think that cloud has been such a fabulous driving force of the changes underway, but we're now entering the professional era of the cloud, leaving the experimental era. And if we maybe had a visual image of the cloud that we've constructed so far, it maybe looks like this. And you might be able to get across the river, but you know, it's a pretty inefficient way to get there. Limited connectivity and capability to get across. You know, and what's led to this? We have you know, the private cloud we've been building, which is 
largely focused on IT as we know it today, where it's uh, cost-driven and we're pulling out costs, and it's you know, slow and complex applications that are being uh, uh, driven, but it has powerful governance and does what I need it to do where I need it for compliance purposes. And on the other side, we have public cloud, which is fast and you know, uh, is able to scale effectively, but it has weak governance and doesn't meet many of the requirements of uh, performance a disconnected and disjointed picture we have today. And as we look to the future, we need to go to the professional era where we've built an environment that is and, that enables efficiency, governance, speed, and growth. And we'll simply call that, and this is what Carl was describing on uh, Monday, with a unified hybrid cloud, where applications are launched to the span, not to the silo. And you know, the example of that that we had in our video was the Intercontinental Hotel Group. And this is just great. I thought this quote from Eric just captured it so well. It's not the big beating the, slow, the small, e.g. it's not the symmetric, it's the fast beating the slow. Right? And this is the largest hotel group in the world, 700,000 guest rooms, 150 million guests yearly and they are eliminating the gap between their on and off-premise IT. They're re-engineering re their entire guest experience in the process, and at the center of it is vCloud Air and the hybrid cloud experience. They are building to the span. And the idea of building to the span is simply what we would call hybrid applications, and this is what Raghu was talking about, that an application is built realizing that there are components of it in the public cloud, pieces of it in the private cloud, and we bring those together through common networking, management, and security, a seamless experience across the two. Now, if we look forward to a couple of years, each of your businesses is gonna be taking, adva taking advantage of a range of cloud capabilities. You'll have your private cloud, You'll have one, maybe two, we expect a small number of IaaS providers, maybe a major and a minor one. And then you'll be picking a PaaS layer. How am I gonna do my next generation development? And then of course, you're gonna have a set of SaaS providers as well, my Workdays, my Salesforce com. You know, so at best case, you know, I have maybe eight or nine clouds I'm taking advantage of. But then, this happened. Love him or hate him, he has changed the trajectory of IT. And I've gone on record as saying of the last decade, I believe this is the most significant impact that will occur to the technology this decade. And when I'm in Germany, China, France, it is very clear that they are gonna demand that their data, their capabilities are within their sovereign borders. Right? They are gonna insist on governance of their critical infrastructure. So if we go back to this picture that we were just describing, it gets a lot worse, right? Because now they're gonna say, yeah, you can run your private cloud, it's gonna be in my country. Yes, you can use that IaaS provider, it's gonna be in my country, and it's gonna have my governance requirements. And thus, it's not just gonna be six or eight of these, all of a sudden, a large enterprise is gonna have 20 or 25 of these services available. Local clouds, local versions of global clouds, regional private clouds, SaaS hosted locally, public services that are using private data. And this is what the unified hybrid cloud is all about. It's about enabling a global point of view across multiple clouds. And that's what we think is so powerful about the position that VMware is pursuing and working with you and created, is that they're all connected, an operating model of a single cloud across these many instances and this is the essence of what the unified hybrid cloud is all about. And the demonstration that we showed uh, yesterday, wasn't that cool, right? You know, we were able to do public, private, you know, cross-country, cross-cloud vMotion. How many of you enjoyed that, right? I mean, I certainly did. That was way cool, Ragu and Yang Bin. And I remember the first time that I was meeting with Mendel and he was describing, right, we were together in Beijing and he was presenting with me at an Intel developer forum and he described to me the first vMotion that VMware had just completed. And we just spent time, you know, just brainstorming all of the use cases. Well, you just saw the first cross-cloud vMotion. And this too will open up an extraordinary amount of innovation and new use cases as we reach across multiple clouds. A key aspect of this is that we have had to go on a journey as a company as well. And VMware, you know, we, you know, we were building the complete stack. 
Why would we worry about working with somebody else because our technology was clearly, everything that you required was done by what we did. And we as a company over the last three years have gone on a journey to open, where we've opened up our management, we've opened up our networking, committed to heterogeneity. And the announcements that we've laid out here in VMworld 2015, you know, this isn't just lip service. This is substantive moves, right, for us to be open, to create interoperability and interoperation across multiple clouds and help our customers to span these complex environments. Simply put, the unified cloud is, the unified hybrid cloud is the future. And maybe just a bit tongue in cheek, you know, can't my clouds just get along? And this is the future that we see that we need to pursue. The third imperative is security. And following Martin and his conversation, you know, security challenge is about protecting people, apps, and data. And this, we believe, is the core of what we need to accomplish as an industry. And we don't do security to protect a particular server, to just hold an edge of a data center, or to protect a specific router or infrastructure component. Security's purpose is to protect people, to protect apps, to protect data. You know, this hit home for me personally, because you remember the big US government OPM breach? My data was part of that, right? So I had to replace a couple of credit cards, and there was a false 1040, or that's for those foreigners, uh, that's a US tax, ref uh, tax return that was electronically filed on my behalf. Right, so you know, that was very exciting. I never had one of those before, so I had to go through that whole process. But this is all about protecting people, apps, and data. And simply put, the security industry has been challenged, it's been messy, it's been complicated. And we spend the bulk of our dollars on products that we know don't really solve the problem. Right? And it's defeated just because this is a safety blanket, but it simply isn't working. And there never has been before a time in history where we've had more security innovation. You know, tremendous innovation occurring by these key companies in security. You know, but it's also an incredible number of startups that have occurred. In fact, you can just have investment portfolios. No you know, category in tech today has a higher PE ratios than the security companies. I mean, extraordinary uh, investments that are occurring there. So security spend is growing fast. I was with the CIO of a major US bank, right? You know, his budget year on year was going down approximately 5%. His spend on security was going up 50% year on year, and nothing is growing faster than the, uh, the only thing growing faster than the spend on security is the cost of security breaches. Something is wrong. And inside of that, we believe that virtualization provides the fundamental requirement allowing us to architect for security. Virtualization provides that Rosetta Stone that sits between the people, the apps, the data, the compute, the network, and the infrastructure, and the devices that connect to it. It is the thing that sits in the middle that fundamentally allows two things that we didn't have before. The first is it allows alignment, precise, dynamic binding of the security functions and services from the applications to the apps, the data, and the users exactly what you need. A web search application doesn't require the same security as a core banking and transaction engine does. It allows for that alignment of services to the place where they need to be delivered. And secondly, Virtualization allows for ubiquity. This is what you've created. This is what we have done together. It enables this end-to-end -end building, allows us to deliver trusted services on untrusted environments. We cannot guarantee the edge, the device, the infrastructure. We need to guarantee the delivery of the service. It assures the right people, the right applications and data through an untrusted set of services can be delivered. Simply put, it enables an architecture for security to be developed. And as we think about this, you know, it places enormous opportunity for industry innovation inside of a context, an architecture, a framework for the industry to build on. And speaking of built on, how many of you have heard this phrase, built in versus bolted on? None of you? I mean, you know, I mean, we've heard this for years about security, haven't we? You know, we got to build it in versus bolting it on. And truth is, it was all nonsense. 
And the problem was we didn't have a place to bolt it in. We couldn't build it in. We were sort of patching it on to this route or this switch or this edge. It was patched on to each application and server and switched. And simply put, we need to put an end to that thinking because it didn't work. And what we now can do for the first time, we truly can architect in security. And virtualization enables that layer of alignment and ubiquity. And making a bold proclamation today, we firmly believe that architected in security allows us to be twice as secure at half the cost. And this, we believe, is a fundamental game changer in accomplishing a secure infrastructure for the future. A customer example of this is maybe Marathon Oil, 125-year-old company, number 25 in the Fortune 500 of companies, part of the critical infrastructure of the United States today, you know, from reserves through refineries to gas stations and delivery systems. And their priority was to simplify, unify their security architecture end to end. And they have done that through NSX, delivering secure uh, controls architected end to end through a broad deployment of NSX. We believe right, a time for a renaissance in security has begun. Maybe tongue in cheek, fries with your burger. Security renaissance has now begun. Seize the day. If we ponder and look forward a bit, what is the next wave of innovation in IT, what is that next big thing beyond what we've done so far? Now, how many of you remember some of those early days of artificial intelligence about 30 years ago? Any of you? Right, you remember some of the hype and stuff that was going on? Yeah, and I remember I was architecting the 486. Right, and I'm you know, working on the 46, and I had some you know, marketing manager come running into my office who his job was to help me get the 486 right. right? You can sort of say I didn't start with a high view of marketing at the time. But he says, AI is really important. You must make sure the 486 is a great chip for AI. So being the good engineer I was, I went and said, OK, so what does AI require of a microprocessor? So I ran a whole bunch of traces and looked at different languages and so on. And you know what the findings were? Make jumps faster. Right? And if you're a microprocessor architecture, you know you always make jumps faster anyway. So after all that work, it was like, do what you're already doing. But we declared it a great AI processor at the time as a result, and I was pretty happy, and the marketing guy went away without adding any value, and the 486 was a great chip. <laughs> and simply put, that period of AI was a failure. It didn't live up anywhere near to the hype. Last year, we had a major campus opening for a VMware. We had John Hennessy, the president of Stanford, come and join us at the time. And when he was asked what is the most important technology that will emerge over the next several years, he said AI. It takes about 30 years for these fundamental core technologies to emerge, to gestate. And I agree with him. This is the heart of the next wave of innovation. And we'll see this ushering in an age that we go from being reactive to being proactive. And we're on this cusp of an era where software agents and capabilities working on our behalf will simply change human experiences. And as we think about some of these crude early examples, they're you know, convenience, they're starting to help, but they're starting to paint the picture of where we're going to go. And you know, maybe right, some of the life-changing aspects where literally software plus injectables inside of people you know, will literally change when you know, they start to sense the constriction of airwaves then in fact, we'll start administering uh, uh, the right medications for things like asthma, predicting it as it occurs. And obviously, these ideas of proactive technologies have implications, right? The creepy versus the convenience. And software has to get to know you. Things like security that we just discussed are critical. And generationally, you know, if we think about it, you know, some of these things we might feel uncomfortable with, our kids are just fine. You know, the things they put up on Facebook just amaze me sometimes. I joined Facebook. To me, it's spy book, just to find out what they're doing. And what we might feel as invasive today becomes invaluable tomorrow. And if we look under the hood right, of this proactive technology era, right, it's going to be enabled by big data. And if we think about big data, these enormous repositories of both real-time data as well as large repositories of historical data, 
being combined with analytics and algorithms that have been matured over that last 30 years and real-time application development. And I like this because I think about, you remember Donald Knuth's fundamental uh, sequence on computer science? You know, algorithms plus data structures equal programs. Those same basics apply. Simply put, the scale now is so much bigger that it can be applied against. And we think about the scale of clouds, software defined anywhere, where software is now writing software, and the telemetry and the data that's being generated by IoT devices being inserted into everything. We truly are entering an age of proactive technologies. And maybe picking on the famous line from Star Wars, how might I serve you? Automate everything. Rule one of building the cloud, ruthlessly automate everything. Collect every piece of data, keep it forever, and that will allow us to predict almost everything going into the future. And the final one is we are entering the decade of the greatest change that has ever occurred in industry and in IT. A prediction by the Washington University is 40% of the S&P will disappear in the next 10 years. Right? And I believe that that change will be even more traumatic for the IT industry. And I'll go out on the limb and say of the top 100 IT companies, 50 of them will disappear in the next decade. And the benefits of incumbency are declining. This was a study from McKinsey. You know, how many years does a company stay in the S&P 500? Look at this, 90 years right back in 1935. Today, 17 years, and that continues to decline and you're off the wrist. Simply put, imperative five is welcome to the age of rattling the cage, or maybe in business terms, taking risks becomes the lowest risk. You must break out to stay relevant in this future. Now, how does this pertain? You know, we've looked at these five imperatives, and how does it pertain to each one of you? The relationship that we've had over the years together as VMware and you, our faithful participants, our partners and our customers, you are almost always the smartest tech person inside of your company, right? They are looking for you and you have an opportunity to lead as you never have before. Your responsibility as that tech expert, this is your day, carpe diem, seize the day in your environment. Be that entrepreneur and that innovator for your respective businesses. And our commitment from VMware is we are going to be your best partner to navigate this world together. Thank you very much.